Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and we'll continue our, our thoughts from there. We looked at those first 11 verses this morning and, and kind of directed our thoughts toward making sure that we're more focused on those things above the sun. Here the preacher, he calls himself a preacher, uh, who is king of Israel, who is the son of David, and the assumption that we would make is that this is Solomon. And Solomon wrote not only Ecclesiastes, but he wrote Proverbs, and, and so a lot of wisdom here. Some of his wisdom is uh, kind of earthly and mundane, and that is not just knowledge that he's gained, uh, it's not just understanding, but it's painful application of those things that cause difficulties in his life. So that he could make summation that his wisdom that he would share with us is, don't do that. That's vanity. That's a waste of your time and your energy. But he contrasts that with the wisdom that we ought to be focused on and uh, what should have happened. And he tells us and reminds us of where he started. So when you get to verse 12 of Ecclesiastes 1, it said, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning the things that are done under the sun. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith, to have seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and vexation of the spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. That which is wanting cannot be numbered. I commune with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate. I have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of the Spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increases knowledge increases sorrow. Now what you would understand from this particular context is he's talking about human wisdom. Now Solomon had asked for godly wisdom. You go all the way back to uh, his encounter with God in his prayer. In 1 Kings chapter 3, he specifically asked for wisdom, for the understanding he would need to govern the people of God. And he near realized that this was a God of his father, David. And he realized how God had worked with David and through David. And now this huge responsibility had fallen upon him. And he wanted to exercise it correctly. And so God granted him his request. He granted him understanding and wisdom. And we look at a few passages in a few moments from Proverbs. You'll, you'll see the flip side of that. And that is you'll hear Solomon's wisdom about doing things as God had told you to do them. But here in Ecclesiastes 1, he's talking about him going after his own wisdom, experimenting with these things of the world and seeing how they really worked and if they worked. And that futility of experimentation, rather than just doing as God instructed him to do, caused him to bring it to a conclusion. That's futility. That cycle we talked about this morning that can seem worthless, where you have everything about nature in this secular motion, it's repeating itself, the sun comes up and the sun goes down, the, the wind goes from south to north and, and makes it circle back again, and, and this condensation that takes place where there's evaporation of water into the, from the ocean into the sky, and it brings down rain, it gets in the rivers, and it makes sure everything is, 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 uh, has the refreshment that it needs, but it goes back to the ocean, and this cycle seems to just go on and on and on. And if you just looked at that from a human standpoint, you could spend the rest of your life researching it and not really appreciating the use of it, the daily application of it. That's why the Lord would always simplify things when he was on this earth. Now just think about that. The one who spoke everything into being, the one who set all those things into motion, the one to make sure that they continue to work. When he spoke to us, when he spoke to man, 
He simplified it for us. In his Sermon on the Mount, even when he taught his disciples to pray, listen to him. We are to pray thusly. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Notice he immediately lifts up our eyes beyond what's under the sun, doesn't he? Our Father who art in heaven. And then he deals with all the matters under the sun that you and I experience while we're here. And one of those things is, give us this day our daily bread. The sun comes up, the sun goes down. What do we do every day? Be conscious. Be aware. That every good and every perfect gift comes down from Him. We, we give thanks for the source of all of our blessing every single day. And we can just say, every day is the same, you know. sun comes up, the sun goes down. When the sun comes up and we give God thanks for that day and for the provisions of that day, that causes us not just to say, well, this is day after day after day. It says every single day is a blessing from God and an opportunity to serve God. And he dealt with every matter, didn't he, about our function here on this life in that, in that prayer that we are to pray. We're dealing with our relationships here, and, and even when we talk about forgiveness, that we are to recognize that the one who is above the, the sun, the one who is not mundane, the one who is eternal, is conscious of what's going on here, on this mundane sphere, and that we would be forgiven as we forgive. Well, eventually, eternally, we want to be forgiven forever, don't we? We don't want Him to remember our sins against us anymore. And so while we're here, and so here's this wise man reminding us that when we look around and see those things happening, they can just seem laborious, so repetitious, doesn't have meaning. If you're just looking at it under the sun. When you put the eternal perspective to it, it goes beyond just our eating and, and our functioning in our daily lives and our blessings. It, it goes beyond that to the eternal part of the resurrection. When you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19, Paul is trying to remind them of the gospel, the good news concerning Christ, of his death and his burial and the resurrection. And he said something that kind of reminds us of what the wise man is saying here, the things under the sun. He said, if in this life only we have hope, we are above all men most miserable. If this is it, just the things under the sun, then you could see why the wise man said, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It's a vexation of the soul. It's tiresome. Just doing the same thing over and over for what? But, if there's more than that, if there's something beyond the sun that we can focus on, then it's not so futile anymore, is it? Now all of a sudden we began to see there's a perspective that we can have and, and there's a different kind of wisdom that we can acquire. When you look at passages like is recorded for us in James chapter 1 and verse 5. We spent some time in James, and James 1 and verse 5 asks us or tells us how to ask God for wisdom. And He'll give it to us liberally, and abrade us not. But notice again, we recognize the source. Our, our minds are focused towards something beyond here. What's the wise man writing about? He took this atmosphere, this, this surrounding, this kingdom, this opportunity, and this mind that God had given him, and he toyed with everything under the sun. Spent his existence as king over Israel. All of his wealth, all of his fame, experimenting with mundane things. What was his conclusion? 
It's futile. It's vaporous. Try to get a hold of vaporous air. Can't get a handful of it. Can't put it in your pocket. Can't wrap it up and send it to anybody. Doesn't exist. Can't hold on to it. He spent his life experimenting with those things that you can't hold on to. When he started his reign by saying, just, just help me have wisdom that I can take care of your people. All of a sudden it became about Solomon. And guess what the people did? The people took care of Solomon. And he knew a lot of things about a lot of things, didn't he? I mean, he knew things about how all the water cycle worked before, you know, our wise people of our generation could give us a weather forecast. He said, here's how it works. Here's why the ocean doesn't fill up. Here's how the wind blows. Not going to stop. Going to continue. All that's important to know while we're here to kind of uh, plan our days and plan our crops and all those things. But if that's all we know, and we die just knowing that, what's the next generation have to do? Learn that all over again. Experiment with that all over again. He said, don't waste your time doing that. I'm speaking as someone who has wasted my time doing that. Don't do that. It's futile. Now, that's the wisdom of the world. And that's what he's talking about. But when you look at this same wise man, writing in Proverbs chapter 2, listen to the contrast and the different kind of wisdom. When you're looking at that wisdom that is from above, not just experimentation in this world, not just wasting your time saying, will that work? How long will it work? How often will it work? Does it consistently work? You just say, God bless me, and I'm going to use his blessings to glorify him. In chapter 2, in those first nine verses of the book of Proverbs, that same wise man said, My son, if thou will receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thy heart unto understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and lifted up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hidden treasure, then shalt thou understand the, listen, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of the mouth cometh knowledge, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the path of judgment, and he preserveth the way of the saints. Thou shalt understand righteousness and judgment and equity, and yea, every good path. Boy, that's different, isn't it? Didn't say anything about being futile. Didn't say anything about being vaporous. It's saying this is what it's all about. But we've got to incline our ears. We've got to pay attention to what God said. And that's what he asked for originally. I want to know how to govern your people the way you want them to be governed. Please give me the wisdom and understanding to do that. And for a very short period of time, he did that. But he didn't continue to do that. So much so that he even violated God's commandments. He married foreign women. He built idolatrous places of worship for those foreign wives. Now, he didn't get that from God. That's not wisdom that God shared with him. That's not understanding that he would have had by what God had instructed his people to do. And he led his people into idolatry. So his wisdom here in Proverbs 2 is, here's what we need to hold on to. He's contrasting with what we have in Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 12 through 18 with what we have in Proverbs chapter 2. There's two different kinds of wisdom. One is listening to what God says and do what God says to do in every circumstance of life, and you'll know the good way, and you can walk therein. And you can feel safe in walking therein. 
And you'll not have to worry about being displeasing to God. You will know every good way and you will be, in God's eyes, righteous. Now listen to the New Testament application of that. Paul encouraged Timothy, who had heard these instructions of God, who'd had this spiritual wisdom from a child. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14, he said, From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which is able to make thee, listen, wise unto salvation. Did you hear that? Timothy, you want to be wise spiritually? Don't go out there and see what it's like to sow you wild oats. He dealt with those matters already with Timothy. Don't let your youthfulness get away from you. Make sure you keep yourself pure. Be an example of the believer. But now he's saying, from a child, you've known those things that can make you wise. Continue in those things. Don't forget them. Make sure you walk in those. And then he reminds him of something that here the wise man is dealing with. He says, all scripture. Now what did Proverbs 2 say? He need to find the instructions of the Lord. He did walk in his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. So Paul said to Timothy, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. These are God-breathed instructions that will allow you to continue to be wise unto salvation. And so all Scripture given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. Now that sounds diametrically opposed to vanity, vanity, all is vanity, doesn't it? Futile, useless, empty. He says to Timothy, you'll have everything you need. God saw that you had everything you needed spiritually. Listen, what did the wise man say in Proverbs 2? Attend your ears, pay attention. Listen. What did this same wise man say when you're talking about the wisdom of the world in Ecclesiastes 1? He said, when you're listening for earthly wisdom, you're never satisfied. You never hear what you want to hear. You never feel like you know what you need to know. It becomes empty and useless. Your eyes never feel like that you have the insight and understanding. But here he says you will. That wisdom that is from above, that's not under the sun, allows us to live under the sun in a way that would allow us to be righteous with God. There's one other passage that the wise man wrote that I want us to use as a contrast. Here in Proverbs chapter 3, and beginning at verse 13, listen to what he said. Here he's talking about the blessings of life that come through this divine wisdom. He said, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things that canst desire are not to be compared to her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. And happy is every one that retaineth her. Boy, isn't that in contrast to Ecclesiastes 1, 12 through 18. Empty, useless, not going to last, vaporous. Doesn't offer us anything. In fact, he said it's madness and folly. It's a vexation. 
of the Spirit. It's tormenting because it's never satisfying. And yet Proverbs 3 says it's pleasant, peaceful. Sounds a little bit like what Paul said to the Philippian Christian, doesn't it? When he told them we're not to be anxious about things of this world. But that we are to go to God in prayer and, and express our thanksgiving and make sure that our confidence and our dedication is to Him. And then he said, What sort of things are true and what sort of things are honest and what sort of things are just? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of a good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And then he said, and the God of peace shall be with you. In that context, it tells us that the peace of God, listen, that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. What does that sound like? Spiritual wisdom. How's your heart kept at peace? How can you be confident when difficult things happen in life? If you know that you're walking in His statutes and His judgments, that you're doing what He tells you to do and the way He told you to do it, you don't control all the circumstances. It's just like everything in nature that he set in course. We can't stop it, but we can understand it, and we can work with it, and we can acknowledge that God set it into place. And then we'll have the wisdom that we need. And when we understand that we can survive, and we say survive, sometimes we put all that emphasis on surviving physically. We live a long life, and we don't have any difficulties in that long life. We, we have really good health, and, and we keep our mind, and we don't have difficulties, and that's not what's under the sun. Our wisdom would say, that's not even realistic. You don't see that in previous generations. So what did it say this morning about the present generation? Generation after generation teaches us that we just live here a short period of time. That's why it seems like we're always learning the same lessons over and over. Because there's a new generation of us. And if we don't have the wisdom that's from above, if we don't understand God's instructions, we're not applying those things, then we go out there like Solomon did. So I wonder how this works. I wonder if that really would be bad for me. I wonder if multiple women in my life would complicate things. I wonder if it would make a difference if I built an altar and just let them worship where they wanted to worship and us still worship at Jerusalem. In fact, I built a temple for us to worship at Jerusalem, so what would be wrong with me building them a place for them to worship? How did it turn out? That was a waste of time and energy, wasn't it? It was devastating. It was a vexation of the Spirit. It destroyed everything that He wanted to accomplish to begin with with the kingdom of God. The Israelite people. So why would we not learn from the wise man? Both that those kind of experimentations are futile. They're empty. And your time's going to be up. My time's going to be up like Solomon's. And we would have wasted the time. But if we listen to God's instruction, if we follow in His statutes and His judgments, we're going to have that valued wisdom that's like fine gold, priceless. You'll be right with God while you're here. You'll have all the blessings of God hereafter. But you've got to be wise in making application of that. That's how important and this discussion was for Solomon. Now, we would keep in mind, wouldn't we, that Solomon just didn't come up with this stuff. So I think this is what I'll write down. We know the Holy Spirit saw that Solomon wrote it down. <laughs> That's probably some of those things Solomon would have rather not written down. But it was all recorded. The good, 
the bad, the ugly. For one reason. One reason only that you and I can read it. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 said, It was written for our learning. That we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. What do you say about the things under the sun? If that's our focus. Hopeless. Futile. Empty. Temporary. But if we focus on those things beyond the sun. Ah, eternal. You see, first John, or rather first Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul said, God desires for all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. He wants us to have this divine wisdom that He's provided, come to a knowledge of the truth. That sets us free from sin, and that gives us a perspective of how we are to live while we're here and not be vexated by the things of this world but be freed from it. That we just use what we have here that God blesses with to serve Him while we're here with the focus and the hope of what awaits us there. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit made sure that the wise man, the preacher, the son of the king who became a king, recorded not only the wisdom that God intended for him to use, that he didn't use, but recorded the wisdom of this world that's futile and empty. You see, it's important for me because I'm just a pilgrim, just a sojourner, just passing through. And if I get hung up of wanting to see what all this world has to offer and libraries are filled with books universities have dissertations lining the walls they have computers filled with research that's been done on things that have already been answered by God and his word because they're not willing to accept what He revealed. And they spend their entire existence, professionally, educationally, experimenting, guessing. You know what happens? Somebody else comes along and writes a dissertation, does research, same subject. Spend their whole life becoming an expert on that subject Somebody else comes along and says, well, that's not right. They left this part out, and so here's what we need to do. And Solomon knew all that because that's what he did. Where is Solomon today? No, he's like the rest of the generations. He lived. When he lived, he was famous. Nobody liked him before him, nor after him in Israel. Unique. And the opportunities had to exercise wisdom but was more interested for a long period of that life of the wisdom under the sun but the Holy Spirit said here's what he found out from that as we make our way through this book you're going to be reminded re- repeatedly <laughs> that this man received not only wisdom that he could have used and glorified God in everything he did as a king, but he had this earthly wisdom that absolutely tortured him. And when he gets through with it, we'll repeat this often, his conclusion will be in the last chapter of this book. The conclusion is, fear God. Keep His commandments. This is the whole duty 
of man. He said, turn to the last chapter. How does it end? But it's important for us to see the lessons that he intended for us to learn. If you hear, and not a child of God, wisdom from above tells you how to become one. Galatians chapter 3 says we're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of us who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. No more Jew to Greek or bond to free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And if we're in Christ, that's a big if. If we're in Christ, then are we Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Oh, being an heir means we have promise of eternal life only in Christ Jesus. No other place to find it. People go looking for it other places. Religions are built of other means of having eternal salvation. When wisdom would say, this is the only way to become a child of God and an heir of the promise. If you've done that, based on your faith that Christ is the Son of God, you're willing to turn away from your sins and repentance, your confession of Him, if you have become a child of God, what kind of wisdom are you exercising every single day? He sees it's important. Jesus said to those disciples who believed on Him in John chapter 8 and verse 31, If, listen to the wisdom, If you continue in My word, then are you My disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What does God want? All men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. You've got to continue in His word. That's where the spiritual wisdom comes from. We can't ever lose sight of it. We can't start experimenting and saying, well, what about this? What if I don't do that? What if I did this instead? We have to continue in His Word. That's wisdom that's from above. If we can assist and help you do that, you let that be known while we stand and while we sing.